Um, okay, hello everyone, uh, back and this will be tradition during uh, this evening and we will do continuously the same stuff during the whole uh, tomorrow's sessions. After sessions we will have some reflections with some experts who have been hearing this from a side and they will give their assessments of what was discussed uh, during the all discussion sh sessions here in Riga conference. Uh, and we will start of course with a topic that was uh, the hottest topic of uh, the previous hour or or so it is um, about the NATO's role in Middle East in uh, North Africa and uh, was it okay was it too weak and uh, Klaus Wittmann is a um, uh, previous military uh, um, but uh, on the other hand he's now working with um, uh, think tank Aspen Institute that is American based I understand but you this are one German. is in German yes, there is the Aspen Institute Germany in, Germany. in Berlin and, and Berlin. I'm a senior fellow there but you've been working with the NATO uh, stuff much. all your life so what do you see this m role of military force we used the first time outside the let's say a, a traditional territories uh, the, uh, not the first time of course technically but well there was a NATO's involvement and was it good was it enough was it uh well uh, that that leads me first of all to the conceptual question most of the problems we face today are not military so there is not really a military solution military contributions are sectoral think of unifil think of the fight against piracy, think of assistance for the African Union. And military options come into play in the context of the uh, UN proclaimed responsibility to protect that was mentioned on this podium uh, several uh, times, which in the Libya case was for the first time the basis for a resolution of the Security uh, Council of the United Nations and uh, responsibility to protect means that despots, dictators, cannot or no longer mistreat their peoples as they like. And against the odds, if you uh, want to come to the NATO operation, yes. uh, uh, against the odds and the rule that s merely with air forces you cannot win a military conflict, this operation in Libya, unified protector, indeed, was a success and NATO again proved to be the only organization with teeth so to speak and with the structure to conduct such an operation and last sentence here NATO avoided to be seen as an occupier promoting its interests patronizing the Libyans so do you think uh, it was the only solution the only way how to react from our side because we are in a way, a foreign force that, uh, well, reacted, uh, we stepped at the side of uh, not clearly uh, a people who were representing power at this side. They were, you know, rebels uh, on the streets. We supported and, 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 of course, we understand they will now form a new Libya, but from the juridical point of view, from the full, you know, diplomacy and democracy stuff, Maybe we were, you know, I don't know, if we, we came in the in right point, you think, and, and we really made our proof that this will be a future solution, this six-day decision, and then very rapid, very forceful, very targeted uh, yes. shooting. <laughs> every, every case is different, and NATO did it only once, that it intervened in a country without a mandate by the United uh, Nations Security Council, that was in Kosovo, when uh, world opinion demanded that something be done against uh, the, the uh, 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 cruelties that uh, uh, Milosevic and the Serbians uh, uh, committed against the Kosovo Albanians. Uh, apart from that, it is a, a normal rule for NATO that it uh, responds to a mandate by the Security Council. And in this case, where uh, the uh, Libyan dictator had um, announced that he would annihilate the rats, meaning his own uh, uh, people, the uh, Security Council made a very far-reaching decision and resolution. And uh, although I see a lot of problems uh, in how this was planned, uh, what the, the French motives may have been to act so, uh, quickly uh, problems also with NATO sol solidarity. Uh, I think it uh, 
it may have saved many many lives and that was the uh, that was the main content of the UN Security Council resolution to stop the killing of civilians by their own government it is not as i said yeah. in the beginning there is never a military solution the military can only be an instrument in the hands of a hopefully well thought out but policy I didn't so so many diplomatic solutions been used before so i didn't so uh, you know well, nato uh, in, envoys going and well, talking in, and and things like that in, At this uh, side, in libya uh, not much was uh, uh, tried before because we were so surprised mm. by uh, the events and uh, as was discussed on the podium uh, this evening uh, we in the U uh, European Union and in NATO were very slow in realizing what is going on in the Arab world and in uh, North Africa. And so the, uh, the uh, development came to a culmination point very quickly. And something had to be done to stop Gaddafi from uh, quelling the rebellion with uh, a brutal force. But I, I say again, there is never a military solution and the problem often comes after uh, the uh, military intervention so as was exactly discussed here. So exactly what, what should we do now? Should NATO l leave it for a, for a diplomacy, for European Union, for, you know, different... You mean other cases? Uh, other cases or Libya? actually here in Libya, Libya now, in because now, even now, you cannot talk to a, a real prime minister of the country. There is no real government of the country to talk to. So there is this, so, well, I think, like uh, a vacuum of the power. I think uh, although NATO may still uh, fly a few attacks uh, as, as long as, uh, as there are still pockets of resistance, NATO's job is mainly done. And in the future of Libya, NATO will not play the first violin, although perhaps a peace force may be uh, needed uh, should the Libyan revolution still lead to a civil war. But... Uh, the real problems are now for NATO's allies as members of the European Union yes. or uh, the uh, United Nations or the Union for the, for the Mediterranean or as individual states. And I think there the uh, priority issue is what uh, in the NATO Defense College where I last worked, a French professor coming from the Maghreb always called Development Solidaire, mm. solidary development, particularly of the Arab reform states' economies, giving life prospects for ever larger and ever younger politicians, as and as quite impressively, the Libyan uh, panelist uh, this evening said, dignity and basic human rights. But that is not so much a NATO task, but uh, NATO is not a neutral organization. NATO consists of members who also uh, work uh, in, um, in other frameworks. But this uh, requires a lot of money, most probably. So if we did our job, you know, to cut, so we did, we helped. Uh, and now uh, so many millions uh, that will be promised well, will I never probably come in reality, as yes, we saw but, it. But so many promises, you know, for Iraq, for Afghanistan, and previous promises that never fulfilled. And at the end, in some cases, you know, NATO has to return or to stay because, uh, you know, not, not a single civilian job is, is done after military operations are completed. I think in, if we stay with the case of Libya, money is not the problem. If you think of these billions that uh, uh, are abroad uh, and uh, which, which now are uh, freed to, to be put at the uh, uh, disposal uh, of, uh, of the uh, provisionary government and they, uh, they have their oil, I think uh, money is not the, uh, uh, the, the problem. So you it, think the problem, they will pay the their problem own bills? Is, okay. The problem is in building structures, building institutions, creating a, a democratic structures in the awareness that democracy is not an import export article but that it is a culture that must grow and that must respect history religion societies uh, societal structures of the country 
concerned, one cannot, as one panelist uh, 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 formulated it today, produce societies. That is a very, a very long uh, process and uh, again, uh, the European Union, uh, as uh, was uh, also mentioned today, perhaps even the Nordic and Scandinavian countries, they all can contribute if asked, not in a patronizing way, contribute uh, advice or experts for the building of uh, institutions, the judiciary, the uh, the, the police, etc. Et um, can I ask you the same, uh, if uh, geography for Libya would be not such a close neighbor of European Union and NATO territories, do you think the action will be uh, more or less the same really? Because we saw many cases in African countries, in sub-Saharan area, we saw, you know, Asia uh, taking North, uh, um, North uh, Korea, uh, still despots are there, uh, threatening their own nations, uh, uh, grabbing millions, uh, you're talking the about the decision, uh, with Gaddafi. The decision, and yeah. So we are kind of safeguarding our neighborhood, not really doing this democracy the, um, uh, yes, fight yes, in uh, the world. Yes, um, I think the decision to intervene somewhere militarily comes together from several motives. One is the values and the spread of freedom and human rights. The other is uh, interests, and that also has to do with the geopolitical closeness. And uh, I, am, uh, I have always been quite critical of military interventions, but I could also tell you a few examples of interventions that were missed, that should have taken place. In oh, Rwanda, really? People say in Rwanda, one parachute brigade at the right place in the right time might have saved a thousand, uh, a million lives, because one knew where the perpetrators were and one could have, uh, uh, with very little force, one could have uh, 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 had a great end effect. But uh, as was also discussed today, there is the uh, difference between Libya and uh, Syria. Why do we intervene in Libya? Why don't we intervene in Syria? I cannot lay out here why these uh, uh, two cases are fundamentally different and why uh, even with the ugly character of the uh, Assad regime, uh, some people um, uh, think that its fall would so much destabilize uh, the Middle East that uh, 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 there's a big difference with uh, uh, Libya where Gaddafi was more and more isolated uh, in the world. But, but closeness, geopolitical closeness, of course, is a very important factor. And I think it's right that Europe and the European Union should, uh, should feel a certain responsibility for the southern rim of the Mediterranean. And I found it qu quite remarkable today that uh, of all people, the Polish Prime Minister said the European Union must treat all its neighborhoods with the same seriousness, yes. meaning that we should not, not speak about east or south. They are both our neighbors, and uh, that is the periphery of Europe where we uh, have a particular responsibility for the civility, but also for uh, human rights. And when he talks, he talks as a leader of European Union's presidency now, actually. Totally. So when he says it, then it's uh, really uh, the strongest yeah. quote probably from uh, today's yeah. conference here uh, in one, Riga. If I, if I may yes, add, of course. Uh, there is one uh, aspect where NATO can, of course, continue to play a role. You may know that uh, NATO has, uh, in the framework of the Partnership for Peace, also established the Mediterranean Dialogue. And uh, with the uh, Gulf region, the uh, so-called ICI, the uh, Istanbul Cooperation Initiative, that might help, perhaps also with the problem that the relations among the different Maghreb countries are not good at all. And uh, perhaps uh, that thought crossed my mind when today uh, uh, former president uh, uh, was uh, asked what could uh, the Scandinavians and the Baltic region contribute. Uh, good neighborhood. That is one thing that, that one can show, that one can demonstrate to others. And you know that the, that the, uh, the, the border between uh, Morocco and Algeria is closed. The uh, 
showing showing how how bad the relations among the Maghreb countries uh, are, and perhaps there also we can have some mediating uh, influence. This uh, was really one of the last and very special uh, rapid reaction with all the rapid reaction forces we somehow developed in under the NATO after 9-11 and things like this. From the military point of view, do you think that this operation gave something a very special as an experience to organization itself, that the NATO is really now capable fighter in the times of crisis for quick solutions that no. the it could fly and, and oh. s you know, shoot no. and there is a solution? You may have noticed that uh, uh, earlier I said uh, the operation, uh, what was it called, Unified Protector, yes. was a success against all odds. Because every military expert knows, and in Kosovo again we have seen it, that it is very difficult, perhaps even impossible, to win a military operation only from the air. I remember during the Kosovo uh, air campaign once uh, a briefing of uh, German Chancellor Schröder by uh, the SECURE, General Wesley Clark, and uh, the NATO Secretary General was present, and uh, I as the uh, advisor of the ambassador uh, was uh, present, and uh, the SECURE said, my mission is very difficult because uh, I have to avoid at all cost casualties. I have to minimize uh, civilian casualties on the other side and I cannot put in ground troops. And that uh, is uh, very problematic and uh, we probably don't have time now to, to, uh, to uh, mention how this campaign also has laid bare other problems within NATO with the solidarity mm. and only eight NATO members took part in that uh, campaign and also with the military capabilities of the European NATO members. America did not take the lead this time, but it had to help with a lot of uh, military capabilities and ammunitions. Which was also interesting experience because before Americans were always uh, front runners in any operations. Of course, thank you. Uh, I'd like thank to you. thank you and thank you for your interest. For our, well, we we will have an interest, and in all the people here online uh, could still pay their interest to the topics we've been discussing uh, already during the day. During tomorrow, there will be many topics you can consult yourself uh, with the program uh, here online, and we will start exactly from 9:30 uh, Latvia time which is 8.30, very early, Central European time, if you like to follow, um, with the topic of can, can Turkey bridge a gap between Asia and Europe, which uh, actually will be just one more reflection of, of where we ended uh, today here in uh, Riga Conference 2011. Now there will be some few closed sessions behind the doors, but maybe uh, during today, uh, tomorrow, I could uh, report some at least... Um, well, temperature in the room, <laughs> what uh, will be discussed now in the night sessions, so-called, here in Riga. So far, we are closing with this uh, live uh, broadcast for today. We meet 9.30 uh, Latvian time, 8.30 Central European time, back here in this channel. Uh, come back, rigaconference.com or... Uh, is it dot .com, dot .lv, sorry, uh, or actually go to um, Delphi, the Latvian local um, news um, um, webcast, where you can follow it and comment it as well. So please use your Twitter, your Facebook, your thoughts. We will um, consult them tomorrow during uh, more conversations. And thank you, Klaus Wittmann, uh, for you. Um, well giving your, 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 your thoughts and your comments so far. Maybe we meet tomorrow uh, um, again. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> it was a pleasure. Thanks.